My name is Michael Spath with the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. This is our 20th year as a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. 20 years now, uh, last month, 20 years ago last month, our first program at Plymouth Church. As we gather tonight, we acknowledge we do so on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware peoples. We confess our implicity in their removal from their tribal lands. We pray that what we do here will honor them in a small way and their descendants. South Africa, Ireland too, are leading the world in their solidarity with Palestine. That's why it's so important that we welcome our friends from South Africa uh, again this year. We're delighted uh, that uh, our 2022 Champion of Justice Award recipient, Reverend Edwin Harrison, along with Reverend Renee August, Drum Master Bevel Spence, and the Full Moon Youth Drummers from South Africa are with us. Yeah. Edwin and Renee were both close personal friends and anti-apartheid activists with Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient Archbishop Desmond Tutu. They were both in Palestine this past Christmas, the first foreign delegation to come in person to stand uh, in solidarity and in unity with their sisters and brothers there. They are strong South African voices in solidarity and unity with Palestine. And so, Edwin and Renee, we thank you. They also both work closely with their, with these, uh, you're going to meet them just shortly, with these young future leaders in post-apartheid South Africa. Part of the Fulmud Youth Leadership Project is the building and playing of drums, and we're going to hear from them very shortly. Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, with your support and your financial help, is the sponsor of their 17-day 10-city Drumming for Peace and Healing Tour. Edwin, Renee, Bevel, and these amazing young people will tell you more about their story in just a few minutes. It's really my, uh, it's my happy pleasure every year to say thank you to a number of folks. A special thank you to our benefactors for our gala. They're all listed in the in the small program. The small program. So make sure that we wanted to make sure that we said a special thank you to them. We're so grateful. You know, many of you have been with us from the start with your commitment and generous, generous financial support. We also want to say thank you to those who uh, have financially contributed to the Drummers Tour, and that's in the eight and a half by 14 program. They're listed on the back of that program. We want to say thank you to uh, our auction donors. We want to say thank you to our host families uh, that they're putting up, Edwin and Renee and the Drummers. Could you just stand? Those of you who are host families who are putting the uh, putting up it in your homes, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you to our program committee. Every year they do the unheralded hard work to make today happen, and so we thank them. They're listed in our uh, gala uh, program. We want to say, thank Morgan Sauer, where are you? Morgan, you want to stand up? Morgan made the baklava and the other desserts for us today. Yeah. You'll take orders, won't you, Morgan? Uh, yeah. All right, good. And of course, a heartfelt thank you to our board, led by our board chair, Terry Doherty. Uh, could the board members please stand? Some of, them are, some of them are back in the uh, auction uh, room. 
So, uh, you know, the programs, the activism, our partners in Palestine, everything that we do, we owe a debt of thanks to this very committed, hardworking board. You'll find two inserts in your uh, program tonight. The first flyer is for our 18th Solidarity Tour next May 2025, which I lead to Palestine and Israel, where we not only see the holy sites, but most importantly, we meet with Christian, Muslim, and Jewish political, religious, and NGO leaders. Uh, over 200 people uh, have been uh, have traveled with me over the last 20 years, over 260 people. Those of you who are in this room here who have traveled with me, would you stand to Palestine and Israel? Thank you. So uh, if you have a question uh, about the trip to Palestine and Israel, please ask, talk with one of them. And we hope that you'll join us next May. The second flyer is for our tour next October 2025 in the footsteps of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, which I co-lead with Edwin Harrison and our partner, the owner of Embrace South Africa Tours, Dion Kitching. During our tour, we meet, we will, we meet with and drone with the wonderful young people that you're going to meet in a few minutes in Swalithe Township. Uh, just a couple do couple hours away from Cape Town in South Africa. This will be the third tour that Edwin and I co-lead with Dion, and uh, there's room for you uh, next October. So please, if you are interested in traveling with us, please see me, and I'll put your name down for our initial information meetings. I'll call your attention to uh, the small program the small eight and a half by 11 program. On the inside, you'll see our upcoming programs. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I really do wanna highlight the next three. This coming Tuesday, a drumming extravaganza at Plymouth Church at 6.30, we have two local African drumming groups. We have uh, uh, one of the drummers from the Japanese Taiko drumming group. We have the Fort Wayne Scottish Pipes and Drums. And then, of course, we have our own drummers, and it's going to be just really a glorious, glorious evening celebration. So join us if you can at 6.30 this coming Tuesday. On Thursday, December the 5th, we have our annual UN Human Rights Commemoration, and we're partnering with the good folks at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation, as well as Poets Portal for an evening uh, call, what we're calling Poets for Palestine. We've invited Bryce Green, who was one of the leaders of the uh, IU protests in Bloomington. He was targeted by the snipers on rooftops. He's given, he's given testimony to the UN commissions. Uh, he's, uh, he's been all over the news last year when the protests and the encampments were taking place. He'll be there to talk for a while, and then we have original poetry that will be shared. If you're wanting to share some original poetry, the information is there to uh, be in touch with Poets Portal by Friday this week. And then finally, for our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration in uh, January of next year, we have the Honorable Reverend Wendell Griffin. Wendell, a uh, retired judge in uh, Arkansas, an appointee of Bill Clinton. Uh, he's a member of the... Uh, Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, one of the leading African-American social justice organizations in the country for clergy and other church leaders. So we're really excited that Wendell will be joining us and he'll have a word for us in January. So we hope that you'll be able to take a look at this, this uh, take, a, take this program home with you, put these dates in your date book and make sure to join us. You know, we're here to celebrating uh, 20 years, but uh, our hearts are heavy for a number of reasons. And, you know, our friends in Palestine, Gaza, and the West Bank, both, while we're sitting here as people of privilege, they continue to suffer. You know, today it's 400 days, 400 days today of genocide. 
under an illegal 76 years in the planning racist Israel genocide with U.S. weapons and funded by our tax dollars. Our friends in Palestine, when we go there, when I was there in March, during the war, with 23 church leaders from all around the country, over and over again, they said, this is a U.S. war. At last count, according to the Gaza Ministry of Health, 42,000 directly killed by Israel. But according to the independent British journal, The Lancet, over 186,000 dead. Seven in ten women and children and making up the largest amount of the dead, the murdered, ages zero to four. And today, as we sit here comfortably, today the Israeli military is permanently clearing. They're ethnically cleansing northern Gaza in order to develop the beachfront with condos and industries to access the oil reserves in the Mediterranean, rich oil reserves in the Mediterranean. In a March speech, in a March speech at Harvard, Jared Kushner said that because it's such valuable property, I'm quoting, Israel should move the people out, then clean it up and develop it. And what did he suggest? They do with the ethnically cleansed northern Gazans. Quote, I would pull them something in the desert, move them there, then go in and finish the job. This is our new administration. This is uh, our new administration. And of course, we gather too, uh, five days after the majority of American voters chose to return to the office of president and an amoral, racist, misogynist sociopath and his cronies who are using the tools of democracy to undermine democracy. How many immigrants, how, how many people of color, how many women, how many of the poor, how many of our LGBTQ plus friends, how much of the planet will be harmed, will be killed, will be dead, four years from now, because of the results of last week's elections. Our democracy is being tested. Our morality is being tested. Our faith is being tested. And as a nation, we're failing the test. And yet, we are here together. We are here together so we do not lose hope because we're here together and each one of you as i look around the room i know most of you not all of you i know most of you i know that your light shines wherever you are you your light shines so whether in palestine or here at home our voice our solidarity our activism and our resistance including actively challenging unjust laws. We at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace promise that we will redouble our active solidarity with our friends in Palestine and in other liberation struggles here at home. So I wanna, I wanna wrap this up. One of the ways we're going to do that is because this is our 20th anniversary, and the 20th anniversary is an organization committed to justice and human rights, we've decided that instead of raising money for ourselves, we will invest in Palestine. We'll invest in Palestine, our 2020 campaign. You see it on the front, on the front of your program. During the coming months and into 2025, by December 31st next year, we want to raise $20,000 each in the following three areas. Area one, Heal Palestine. We've already been talking, some of you met Steve Sosabe, who was here, the, the founder and the leader of Heal Palestine. 
Steve has more than 30 years' experience uh, working with medical care and surgical care for children in Gaza. He's opened two pediatric cancer clinics, one in Bethlehem and one in Gaza. One, the one in Gaza was bombed a couple of times already in the last year. Right now, they're providing medical care, food, humanitarian aid, and more in Gaza. We're working with a couple of pediatricians in town, and uh, we're hoping to bring a teenager from Gaza to Fort Wayne next year for pro bono surgery. The teenager and her or his family to Fort Wayne for pro bono surgery uh, in 2025. That's our goal. Please be generous in supporting Heal Palestine. We want to support our mission partners. Many of you who have been on the trip with me or who have come to our programs, you know Abed Al-Shroor and uh, Beautiful Resistance in the Ida Refugee Camp in Bethlehem. You know Ayman and Arub at the Resource Center in Nablus, in the old city Nablus. You know Teshakur and Iyad Bernat and their kids in Berlin. You know Daoud and Jehan and Daher and Amal. We refuse to be enemies at the Tent of Nations farm outside of Bethlehem. And you know Zumbi, Zumbi, and Osama, and Tarek, and Lucy, and their team at the um, Conflict Resolution Center at the foot of the apartheid wall in Bethlehem. You know these people, and so we want to we continue our support and increase our support for them in the coming year. They're under siege like never before, and with this new U.S. administration come January, their lives and their livelihoods will be further threatened. And then finally, area three, we want to invest in the next generation of leaders of Indiana Center for Egypt, Middle East Peace, leader activists. We, we've seen a number of amazing young activists. They've been joining us in our work and are ready to step into leadership positions in our organization. We want to invest in them. We want to invest in these next, this next generation of leader activists with scholarships for solidarity tours, conferences, and other leadership programs. It's an ambitious campaign, and yet we're bold enough to come to you and ask because you've been so generous and because the need is so great. So, with your support these past 20 years, we've developed a, a national reputation through our partnerships, our Zoom interviews, our hosting of leaders in the movement, and more, international global leaders. I'm so proud, I really, I, I look around the room at, at us, you know, I look at our board and, and I'm, I'm just very, very proud. We're not Washington DC, we're not LA, we're not Chicago, we're not Boston. They've got programs there, they do. We stand up, we, we are bold, we're, we're aggressive, we, we're committed. And so I'm so proud of uh, the difference that a group, small group of dedicated people can make. And it's all been because of your help and support. Pebbles of justice and hope and friendship tossed into the, the pond in Fort Wayne fell halfway across the world in Palestine. We're doing this together. Our commitment to the people of Palestine, our commitment to justice and human rights here at home is unshakable, unshakable. So thank you. Thanks to each one of you for your solidarity with the people of Palestine and with us. And thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being here tonight. We want to turn it over now. We want to turn it over now to Bevel Spence and the Fullwood Youth Drummers from South Africa. Thank you everyone for being here with me. <laughs> Na 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 na
Evening, everybody. My name is Zenande Maekiso, and I'm from South Africa. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Godfrey, my English name. My Posa name is Zigo Lisile. I come from South Africa, a small town called Hermanus. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. My name is Inati, short for Inati Nkosi, meaning the Lord is with us. My surname is Paliso. I come from Cape Town, South Africa. Hello, everybody. My name is Sia Sanga. It, like, it, it, it sounds like a song. Sia Sanga Lucibo. I'm from South Africa, a small town called Armanas, in a place, in a township called Zweliche. Zweliche means a beautiful place. Meeting you beautiful people. Hello everyone, my name is Inga Janssen and I'm from South Africa. Hello everyone, my name is Zairo Dean Gedold and I'm from Hermanus, South Africa. Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Swart and I'm from South Africa. Hello everyone, I'm Fusima Tham and I'm from South Africa, Hermanus. Good meeting everyone. My name is Antonio Ayabonga Kolozana. I'm from Armanas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tapelo Ponwane. I'm from Armanas in South Africa. Thank you.
Um, I'm accustomed as I am to using a mic because <laughs> we get heard on our drums. So this is what we do all day every day. Um, but we don't only play drums, we also make drums. And the drums that they are playing are drums that they've actually made themselves. Um, and this is, this is African music. And African music is traditionally communal. It's something we do together. We don't go and watch people play guitars, pianos, violins, and sit and do nothing. We get involved in what's happening, and that's part of the communal spirit of drumming. It keeps us together, it keeps us strong. So when we drum, we like people to get involved in what we do. So unfortunately, we don't have enough drums for everybody, but you do have a lap, you do have a table. Just make sure the glasses don't pop off the table. <laughs> And what we're going to do is we're going to play a couple of rhythms. I'll teach you the rhythms, and then we're going to see if we can put it all together. All right? So use the table, use your lap, and then just follow us. It's a meal that we eat, and it goes really up. It's one, two, three. Which is uh, sandwich, peanut butter, sandwich. 
There we go. Everybody up. And you're going to drum on the floor with your feet. So we want to see your feet come up and down. And if the person next to you's feet are stuck, give them a hand. So let's see your feet moving on the ground. We go.
words uh, is Ubuntu. Ubuntu. I am because we are, we are together interdependent with one another. I want to invite uh, Reverend A. August and Reverend Edwin Harrison to come and to speak with us. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Now that the drummers have all woken you up, <laughs> You're welcome to fall asleep again. <laughs> but you, you, you can sleep, but you may not snore. Uh, you might wake up the person next to you. <laughs> it's a great privilege for me to be with you again after having been here in 2022. Uh, thank you, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Thank you, Dr. Michael Spath and the, all, the whole committee. It, it is a real privilege. Um, I, I, uh, I admire you for inviting us to be here again. I really do. Uh, and then, of course, some of you came to visit us in South Africa. And I hope many of you will also come and visit us. And if you want to know more about that particular visit, please speak to those who wait. Maybe those of you who visited us, please stand, please stand so I can see who you are. Those of you who came, there's Chuck over there, there's Dolly, there's the Stevensons, the Cat uh, Caldwell. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And there's a uh, as well. Uh, it really was wonderful to have you all here. Pam, Pam spoiled me thoroughly. She made two beautiful stoles for me. One is a Palestine stole uh, that has the word sumud on the one side here. You know, those of you know, it means steadfastness. And the steadfastness of the Palestinian people I carry with me we and Rene can say more about this, but we we had a 25 mile uh, pilgrimage for Gaza in Cape Town. We walked, we took our bodies, and we walked 25 miles, starting in the morning at seven, and we ended in the evening, I think, at six p.m. Uh, and and it was 33 degrees Celsius. I, I don't know what that is Fahrenheit for the whole day. And Pam, I wore your stole, the red stole, the red Palestine stole, the whole day. <laughs> the whole day. I wore that stole. And then the second one, of course, is the beautiful uh, VYLTP, the Fulwood Youth Leadership Training Program stole that has the South African flag um, on it, as well as the logo of the, the youth program. Which I, together with John McGruch and others, we and Rene, we co founded in 2016. And by the way, most of the young people sitting there, they were on the 25 mile pilgrimage as well. They woke up at five in the morning and we, threw, we drove all the way to Cape Town and we joined the pilgrimage. And some of them, I know Rene was trying to tempt me to, to uh, get to a vehicle. She wasn't feeling too well in the day and trying to tempt me to get. And I said, no, I will not go into a vehicle. I'm hard for in that way. And I walked the whole day in 33 degree heat in Cape Town. But of course, those of you who know Cape Town, it's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful city. Uh, and, and the whole day you have the sea on the one side and the mountain on the other side. And, and you just simply move through the city. And of course, people who, who saw us, uh, there's some areas that that they could not believe that they, you know this amount of people going through with Palestine flags and so on, walking through. And at every stop, there was a prayer. We had a the South African Jews for a free Palestine who did a prayer in the Plumstead area. And then at Claremont, we stopped the mosque and the, the Muslims were fasting 
but they put on all the food for us and and uh, we were able to eat and drink and have oranges and so on before we continued our journey um, towards the city. And our Anglican Archbishop, Archbishop Tagovahova, joined us for the last uh, 10 kilometers, perhaps, of, of, the, of the pilgrimage. And yes, so we, we, we put our bodies where our mouth is, and then we've placed our bodies here amongst you tonight. Uh, both Ren and I are Episcopal, Anglican priests. We are not of the frozen chosen type. Uh, we leave that to the Episcopalians here. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, we, we just come to wake you up here, you know. We just, um, one of the, the blessings of this particular trip is that the Bishop of Indianapolis, Bishop Jennifer Basketball Burroughs, will be our, our host in, uh, in Indianapolis. And for that, we are grateful. So you're not altogether frozen, at least there's some unfreezing happening uh, while we are here. Wonderful to be with you. Thank God for you. Now, Rene and I, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we normally take the, the bread and the wine, take the bread, and we go and we say, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. We, 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 we do that. You all understand that. And... Rene reminds me often that the people are the body of trust. There's a story from Latin America from Archbishop Romero, uh, who one day uh, the soldiers went into a Catholic church and they desecrated the space. And they went into the ombre and they took out the Holy Communion that was already consecrated and they trampled on it. And the people were appalled by it. And Archbishop Romero arrived on the scene a few minutes after this happened and they said, they said, Bishop, they've trampled on the body of Christ. <clears throat> and he said, yes, I know. The body of Christ is being trampled upon every day. Every day. And this is what we witness. But I talk about that because we are responsible for each other. And in these times, we have to remind ourselves that we are one with another. <clears throat> We can easily go to our lowest base instincts in times like, like this. But it's important that I come all the way from the southernmost part of Africa to remind us all that we are responsible for one another. We are responsible. Can I have some water, please? <clears throat> We in South Africa, we take that very, very seriously. Our first president, Nelson Mandela, reminded us that South Africa will never be free until Palestine is free. Never. And that deep intuition from Nelson Khorizhvashna Mandela, that deep intuition remains with us today. Archbishop Tutu made it clear that when he visited Palestine, even in the 80s already, him, Jimmy Carter, and others came and said, actually the situation is, is apartheid. And, and we, we go further. We say 
it is worse than apartheid. Because there was never a time when the regime in South Africa, no matter how evil they were, they did not bomb the townships, they did not drop bombs on us. There was never a time when there were the roads for whites only. That, that never happened. And so when we, when we see it happening in Palestine today, as South Africans, we can uniquely say that this is worse than apartheid ever was. Long before Ben Salem said it, long before Human Rights Watch said it, they got, it's good that they're all saying it eventually. But I was part of something called the Russell Tribunal on Palestine in 2011. 2011! John Dugard was part of that, Professor John Dugard, the doyen of international law. And I asked him then, and this is 2011, I asked him, I said, Prof, why are we doing this? Why are we having this Russell Tribunal? This, this tribunal is named after Bertrand Russell, uh, the philosopher, and the mathematician. Uh, there was a Russell Tribunal on Chile and on other places as well. And this was a Russell Tribunal on Palestine because the, the issue then was, and is still today, is what happens when a state can act with absolute impunity and get away with it. What, what happens? Can we as human beings really allow that to happen? The answer <laughs> for us was no, we cannot allow this to happen. And that's why we called prominent people together in 2011. And I went to Dugard and I said, uh, Prof, Prof, why are we doing this? He said, we are doing this because we are collecting evidence. One day, we will take this evidence to the ICC and the ICJ. And I say this to you because this happened 13 years ago. 13 years ago, we were seized with the question, is Israel an apartheid state? And we came out with the answer then that it certainly is. And, and, and you don't, Professor John Dugat will, will not say this very lightly. And so he, together with lawyers like Daniel Makov in London and others in Ireland and so on, were all working together, putting this file together. And so when South Africa decided to take Israel to the International Court of Justice um, for the crime of genocide, the South Africans who were speaking on that day could speak as if they were the ones suffering themselves. We, we have put ourselves completely into the shoes of the Palestinian people. And, and, and I can, I can be, besides John Dugard, Tebeka, Tulkan Tobi, one of our advocates, one of our top advocates, one of our top legal thinkers in South Africa, was speaking on that day. Um, Shamila Hassim as well. And Hassim was one of those people who actually went to Gaza long before the ISDJ. And, and when she arrived, uh, first of all, she had to fly to Tel Aviv. When she arrived there, she was detained and interrogated because she looked Palestinian. It, 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 they said she was misrepresenting who she actually was. But she's one of our top advocates and top legal teachers in South Africa. And as South Africans, this is not a strange thing at all. It's not, it's, it's the most natural thing for us, actually. Our founding uh, mothers and fathers, and sorry, uh, I'm going to speak mainly about the fathers for the moment, if you don't mind. There was, there was Nelson Mandela, a lawyer. There was Edgar de Klerk from the National Party, a lawyer. The key negotiators were Ruth Mayer, a lawyer, and Cyril Ramaphosa, who is our current president, a lawyer. 
And the four of them, together with all the different teams working with them, crafted what even someone like RBG would say was the best constitution in the world. That's, that's top human rights lawyers across the globe saying, if you're looking for a constitution uh, to learn from, to copy, go and have a look at the South African constitution with the Bill of Rights uh, and with various uh, important checks and balances in this constitution that we have been able to craft. And so law for us is important because we know how law was abused before. And that is why we have this deep human rights culture in South Africa. And so it was appropriate that we take uh, Israel to the International Court of Justice. But I want to say that this is not simply a legal matter. This is a moral issue. This is an issue of narrative. And the Palestinians who, who talk to us, they say, what you've been able to do, you've been able to capture the narrative. Because for too many years, for too many years, we were not heard. We could not find a way to be heard. And for the first time, the world is actually hearing what is being said. And I can, again, I don't want to talk forever, but even a few weeks ago, I was speaking in a place called Stalinbosch in the West of Tech, which is a big, very beautiful wine country. And I was speaking there to people uh, who are mainly from within the Afrikaner community, mainly 60 plus years old, uh, you know, thought leaders in, in the Western Cape in particular. And this would not have been possible even last year, even two years ago. But suddenly people are listening and people are questioning and they're saying, why is it that we are only hearing this now? Why is it that our leaders have misled us so badly over the years? And slowly we are beginning to be able to, to tell them what is truly happening. And so I'm going to say one last thing. And that is that Michael Spath and others came to South Africa in May. And Rene was there as well. And we, we started talking about the launch of a global anti-apartheid movement for Palestine. That's what is necessary at this moment. We South Africans, we understand what that means. There was an anti-apartheid movement globally for us, people across the world. There were individuals in London who would stand at the South African embassy in Trafalgar Square 24 seven, in the middle of the rain, in the middle of the night, they would stand there with a board that says Free Mandela. And we understand what that kind of solidarity means. And I can promise you today that nothing less, it will take nothing less for the world to wake up and to see what, what, is, what is happening and for, the, for humanity to stand up and to say enough is enough. This must stop now. We, we believe that the non-violent options must remain open. If we, if we are not going to be determined to do that, then it's going to be an eye for an eye, and, and we are going to be killing each other off, and there's going to be no hope left. And so the deepest parts of our humanity says, it is possible to organize, 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 and that we must. Finally, uh, end of this month, November the 29th, I would just have got home, gotten home, 28th and 29th, we, the South Africans, have decided that we are going to organize ourselves and start the first chapter of this global anti-apartheid movement. Uh, I've been very involved in the, in the organizing of it, even though I'm not going to necessarily be there, but we want to show other countries, we want to say to the world, to the Americans, to the Europeans, to people in Latin America, in Australia, we want to show, to say to them, here's a way to organize. 
but we're going to take the first step. We South Africans, we will take the first step. We this 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 burden has been placed on us, and we will we will take that responsibility because we know how international solidarity and friendship, uh, how people were concerned about us when we were in that very situation, and so. I really can only say thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for, for taking the stand you are taking. Thank you for, for swimming against the stream, as, as you probably had to do a lot, maybe within your own families, maybe within your friendship circles, you had to do that. But believe me, you're doing the work of the angels. You're doing the work of the angels. Continue doing that. Don't stop. And now I'm going to hand over to another angel called Rene August. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Um, it is a joy for me to be here with you. Um, I want to add my thanks to Edwin's and um, just say that this work that we are doing together is not only work that we must do, it's work that makes us human. Gaza is the moral crisis of this world. What the Isaac says, if it does not trouble you to your core, there is something wrong with your humanity. Palestinians will live and die, but you might lose your soul. Thank you, Edwin, for that um, brief summary of some of the South African story. This was not intentional um, to help bring a little bit of the gender balance uh, back into a deeper conversation. Um, but the question I have for us on this Sunday after Mega Week is what can we do in the face of the empire? What can we do in the face of the empire? A story from my sacred text, Exodus chapter 1, tells a story of the actions of four women. If you're familiar with the story, verse 8 says, Now there was a new, a new king, a new pharaoh, who, who didn't know Joseph. And so he said, Look at all these Israelite people, they are so numerous and powerful. If there was a war, they might rise up against us. We need to deal shrewdly with them. And so his first act was to call the Hebrew midwives. He said to them, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew woman and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she can live. The foolishness of Pharaoh to undermine the actions of a woman. And so the boys continue to be born, and Pharaoh calls these midwives back into his quarters. What is happening? I thought I told you to kill the boys. And the midwives say, Oh, but Pharaoh, these women, they are something else. Before we get there, they've already given birth. And so there's nothing we can do. You, you see, behind that story, it says, now these midwives, Sapphira and Poa, they feared God more than Pharaoh. The first act of civil disobedience. When we fear God more than the empire, we find the courage to say no. And because of the courage 
of these human lives. Moses stood a chance. What is the act of civil disobedience that you might be required to take in Fort Wayne, in Indiana, today, tomorrow, next week? It will take a radical act. But we are not acting radically for the sake of trying to be that. We are asking the question, what is it that gives the empire power where we can say no? The second woman in the story is Moses' mother. And so she knows that there's this law because now the boys are being born. And so Pharaoh gives instructions to all the soldiers. Take every boy under the age of two and throw him in the Nile. Wow. So Moses' mother is pregnant. There's no scans beforehand, no gender reveal party. <laughs> but, but she knows that there's a chance that she's going to give birth to a boy. And so... She makes plans. So she wove a basket. She lined it with tar. In hopeful expectation that if it is needed, she has a plan. We know that the mega dream has dire consequences for many people in your country. You need to get busy making plans. Where will you hide people? What are you going to do with your homes? How will you use your car? Might there be a nest egg? We cannot defeat the empire if we are not ready to make some plans. The third woman is Miriam, Moses' sister. She's playing by the side of the river. To the outside, it looks like a little girl having fun. But she is listening, listening with a protective ear to make sure that her baby brother is okay. And so Pharaoh's own daughter comes to the river and finds this baby. She picks him up. Isn't this a Hebrew child? She says. A derogatory term. And quick as a woman. Shall I get someone to feed him? Miriam transforms Moses' identity from a, a slave child to a hungry baby. She humanizes him. What words must we learn? So that when you talk about a foreigner, an immigrant, what other words might we use? to humanize one another. I think it's interesting that um, if I as a black person go to another country, I could be called an immigrant, but if I was white, I'd be an expat. <laughs> See how words can humanize? We need to learn new language that affirms the dignity and humanity of all people, regardless of who they are. And then finally, the actions of Pharaoh's daughter. What does she do? She sees this child and reaches into her own pocket to pay someone, Moses' mother, to feed him. 
And then she opens her door. She takes him in. She feeds him, clothes him, and educates him. You see, Pharaoh couldn't be bothered to tell his daughter what to do. And because of her actions, Moses grows up in Pharaoh's home. And because of the actions, the courageous, unspoken actions of four women, the midwife, the mother, the sister, the daughter, Pharaoh's empire is undermined and defeated. Of course, we only remember Moses. But Moses can only be Moses because of the actions of some courageous women. Today, in your power, you have more resources than they had. We will need to act in civil disobedience. In my country, I know it's easy because my government, my government is the government who took our taxpayers' money to take Israel to the ICJ. It might be as radical as withholding your taxes. Don't quote me. <laughs> but civil disobedience will be necessary. It is the only language that the empire understands. The men must get busy making plans, find words for humanizing one another, and exercise radical, extravagant hospitality. In the course of history, we know that those actions undermine an entire empire. And so what can we do in the face of a mega dream and an empire? They are small collective acts of courage. I want to get very, very practical and say that when I was uh, leaving Palestine in May this year, we were there over Christmas, spent Christmas in Bethlehem, and then we crossed over the Albany Bridge into Jordan. And as we were driving out, there were probably a hundred cement trucks waiting to go into Israel. The cement trucks I'm talking about is those big round ones, you know, with the wet cement is in. Like, that cement is going to be used today. A hundred trucks. When I left in May, 400 trucks of cement a day is driving into Israel from Jordan. That was in May. It might be more today. I don't know who owns those cement companies. I don't know who owns the trucks. I don't know who fuels the trucks. But there's collective action that we need to take together so that we can make plans and respond with courage to an empire that is hell-bent on genocide. And unless we do that, unless we do that, now that you know, you may also be culpable. And so this is not to lay a heavy on you, but to say things are serious. And we need to work together. And we need to work for the long haul. Mitri Rahib says, the bad news is that empires actually only change every 300 or so years. And so when we're fighting the empire, it is not like running a sprint, but like running a marathon. The difference between running a sprint and running a marathon is how you breathe. 
we need to live. So that together, together we can say yes, we stand in the hope that one day we will see a free Palestine. <coughs> She couldn't stay, but our friend Lubna Ahmed wanted me to present this uh, to uh, Renee and to Edwin. It's a ceramic map of Palestine with the Dome of the Rock, third holiest site in Islam, and its heart. And on the back she wrote, from the heart of Palestine, to the free people of South Africa and three hearts. So I give this to the two of you on her behalf, and her family, and on her behalf. Uh, the, the apartheid regime could not stand could not stand, withstand the singing of the South African people. When I was here two years ago, I, I taught you a little song. Do you remember that? Those of you who were here two years ago. It, it, it is a beautiful chorus, and we'll, we'll do a few of it tonight. Um, but it's simply, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about the spirit within us and loving the spirit within us. Uh, Inati, where are you? Come, come and join me here. I, I can't sing like the angel voice, the angelic voice of Inati Paliso. She talks every now and then that she's very shy. I don't believe a word of it. Um, it says Sia Can you say that? Sia Boyo. Boy spirit. Sia Kutanda. Moyo. Let's sing it together. Sia Kutanda Moyo Dwele Moyo Dwele Moyo Dwele Sia Oh, 